When we first saw the track listing for the Nier OST, most of us probably weren't thinking, I bet the one called Grandma is gonna be awesome. To be fair, the original Japanese title, Obachan, is a prettier word than Grandma. But this theme for Kaine's late grandmother is one of the most celebrated songs in the series, and if you look at the sheet music it's not immediately clear why. Many tracks in this game are complex and surprising, but Grandma isn't one of them. The piano part is interesting, but it's also deeply repetitive. The melodies and harmonies are simple. Don't get me wrong, this is an impressively written piece of music, and there are some unique choices in the composition, but from a music theory standpoint, it's hard to see how this track is able to stand shoulder to shoulder with other series classics like Shadow Lord and Song of the Ancients. The normal approach we take on this channel will still be helpful, but it won't help us find the soul of this piece. Composition isn't what makes Grandma excellent. Performance is. All that said, we are going to start with a look at the composition, just to get familiar with how the piece is built. Grandma does share many characteristics with other beloved pieces in the game. For example, it's written in the same key as Snow in Summer and has similar harmonies. Because of that, muscle memory led this pianist, Zakid, into half-accidentally making this mashup arrangement. Grandma is written using a harmonic minor scale, like Song of the Ancients, Ashes of Dreams, Dispossession, there's a lot of harmonic minor in Nier. Harmonic minor differs from the natural minor scales we hear more often in that the seventh note in the scale is a little higher. This note is called the leading tone, and it creates a sense of leading the piece closer to resolution. That slight change takes the sad tones of a natural minor scale and adds a bit of drama to them. Oh, and if you're wondering why we hardly ever talk about major scales on this channel, it's because they're generally pretty happy and we like to suffer here. Actually, here to knock down one more barrier between you and even more sad content is this video's sponsor. No, I'm serious this time. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a massive 82% discount for viewers of this channel that will keep you connected for the next three years. The link isn't going to work forever because that's not a sustainable business model, so you'll want to jump on this soon. The truth is, streaming services have a lot more overlap in their catalogs than they'd like us to think, so before you sign up for a new platform just for one show or movie, you can use Atlas VPN to see if it's available in another country on a site you already pay for. If you don't know where to start, Madoka Magica is a short anime series that's available on Netflix just across the pond. It has a wonderful soundtrack, and it's about existential nightmares being thrust on innocent people who deserve better. You'll love it. In addition to all the normal benefits of a VPN, you can also have Atlas VPN scan to see if your email address has ever been involved in any data leaks, which it does in approximately zero seconds. I didn't even know Roll20 had a breach in 2018. This is why it's important not to reuse passwords, kids. To get three years of top-tier VPN service for just $1.99 a month, go to get.atlasvpn.com slash barouche and you'll be up and running in a matter of minutes. And yes, that is how you say my name, according to Ellis Island. All right, let's dive deeper into Grandma. <laughs> God. Grandma has one thing in its composition that is unique within the soundtrack, and that's the murky time signature situation it has. Music is broken up into measures that usually contain an equal number of beats. This piano part definitely comes six notes at a time. but is it coming in two groups of three notes or three groups of two? It's hard to say because the pianist in this recording places emphasis expressively instead of rhythmically, so you can hear it both ways. Quick tangent, because it seems wrong to talk about performance without naming the performer. It's always awkward to talk about music credits in Nier because the soundtrack was a highly collaborative effort with many people wearing multiple hats. Keiichi Okabe is the music director and lead composer, but members of his studio Monika are also responsible for much of the music and arrangements. The first pass of the soundtrack also had another composer named Takafumi Nishimura, who worked for Nier's developer Kavia. Genius.com says that Grandma was written by both Okabe and Ishihama and arranged by Takada, but Last.fm doesn't mention Takada at all and also credits Keigo Hoashi as one of the writers, which seems likely because Genius also says he was the pianist for this track, so that's him we're hearing, probably. Takafumi Nishimura is also listed as a writer, which could be because it's true or could be because he's just attached to the project in general. And I don't even know where these two sites got their information, they're just the only sources I could find. So out of the five people who wrote the original 
Mjolnir soundtrack, all of them might have been involved in writing Grandma. And that's without talking about the 2021 arrangement that could have been done by any combination of these seven. What we can't say for certain is that the vocals were done in both releases by popular game and anime vocalist Emmy Evans, because no one else sounds like that. Anyway, when the vocals come in, the timing gets even weirder, because this melody comes four beats at a time, which was not one of the options. As a listener, it's not that hard to put everything together as we hear it, because mathematically everything does line up nicely, but in terms of sheet music, it's funky. There are two equally correct ways to write this, and they're both kind of ugly. I'm choosing this one just because it feels silly to put the entire piano part in triplet brackets. In terms of what this does for the piece, it gives us the intricate undercurrent of the piano, the weight of the slow vocals, and the ethereal quality of those two things not quite matching up. The piano part on its own is probably the most compelling part of the writing. It flies through eight measures of non-stop runs that just loop over and over without end. I mean, there is a fringe exception in the re-release, but I'm ignoring that. Because the piano stays in this short loop for the whole piece with definitely no exceptions, it dictates what harmonies will work best in the piece and in what order. Most of this progression is pretty standard for harmonic minor, but there's a major exception in measure 4, pun intended. This is a B-flat major chord, and it comes right after a B-flat minor chord. The chord B-flat minor is the most complete state of rest we can have in the key B-flat minor. It's called the tonic chord. The tonic chord always has the same name as the key it resolves tension in. Movement from the tonic chord to absolutely any other chord will increase tension, so even though major chords generally sound happy, obnoxiously so, when we hear a B-flat major immediately after a B-flat minor here, it's a bit off. The only difference between a B-flat minor chord and a B-flat major chord is whether this D is flat or not. Listen for the D natural in measure 4, and you can hear it single-handedly create tension in the piece. This is something that Grandma and crowd favorite Song of the Ancients have in common. Both of them contain moments where they've resolved all the tension in the phrase, and all they have to do to tie everything up in a neat little bow is keep playing notes in the tonic chord, damn it! This may not have been an intentional connection originally, but in the 2021 remake, the music team put the vocal melody from Grandma into Devila's guitar part in Song of the Ancients. This particular trick of moving from the tonic minor chord to its matching major chord is only used in these two tracks, but the general concept of ending minor key phrases with tense major chords is common in the near soundtracks. Very common. It's come up in every near track I've talked about on this channel, and it's in several others as well. Because so much of music is subjective, context plays a much stronger role than individual chords ever could. Music psychology is bizarre, and Keiichi Okabe is a master of manipulating it. Unless he didn't write those parts. He probably did. I don't know. We'll never know. Back to Grandma. At the end of the piano cycle, Evans holds out the last note for a long time. This note is B-flat, the tonic, the resting place. Ending a melody with the tonic note held out like this gives a sense of finality to that part of the piece. But if you look at the piano part, we stop hearing the tonic near the end and start hearing the tension-building leading tone instead. The same thing happens again at the end of the second vocal melody. This might not seem like a big deal, but in my opinion it's one of the most defining elements of Grandma. These two sounds pull the listener in different directions. The pulse of the piece, the piano, doesn't show any sign of stopping, so we don't lose momentum during this pause in the vocal part. But because the vocal part rests on the tonic at the end of the phrase, the vocalist sounds like she's reaching the end of a thought. The piece as a whole has a tireless pace, but every phrase of the vocal part is self-contained, and this matches the forlorn, wistful air the piece has in the story. Kaine's grandmother only exists in memories, in the past tense. Fragments come and go, but there is no continuation. There's nothing ongoing, nothing new. 
but the grief and memories continue. It's a little surprising how well this works, because allegedly, Grandma was not written to be Grandma. Wikipedia says it was originally written as music for the prologue where Snow and Summer ended up. The source for this claim is locked behind a login screen that's linked to a dead backend server, but it seems plausible enough. Tracks change purpose during production all the time, and I think it was the right call here. During Nier's second visit to the Airy, he finds the settlement under attack from a massive shade called Hook. We learn later that it's the reason Kaine's grandmother is dead. And to add insult to injury, when it feels threatened, it attempts to disarm Kaine by speaking to her in her grandma's voice. This isn't when we hear grandma. Kaine's theme plays here instead. Grandma starts playing at a very specific point in the scene. Why go on living anymore? Is that it? Hmm? Are you finished yet? Don't speak to your grandma like... You're going to stop talking now. And then I'm going to slowly walk over to you, cram my hand inside your goddamn chest, and pull out your heart! My grandmother would never say that! She gave me the strength to deal with this goddamn mutant body! Do you know how long I've been like this? How much I loathe myself? This theme isn't just tied to Grandma Curly in general. It's about who she was and is to Kaine. The sadness of losing her, the warmth of remembering her, and the home they were for one another. It speaks to the parts of her grandma that no one could ever replace or take away from her, and that conviction gives Kaine the strength she needs to finish the fight. When the piece loops back to the top, strings and percussion are added in. The percussion has a military feel to it, which seems more suited for the prologue than for this scene, and maybe that's why it was removed in the 2021 soundtrack. But whether or not it's thematically appropriate, I do think it sounds incredible. That's already everything, at least in terms of the notes being played in the 2010 arrangement. Eight measures of piano, 16 measures of vocals, and support from the strings and percussion. That's it. Like I said, it's good, but what we see here in the sheet music doesn't make it completely clear why it's so haunting. Simple repetitive compositions like this one are both opportunities and obligations for the musicians to use their instruments to speak to the audience. For that, we turn to vocalist Emmy Evans and, theoretically, pianist Keigo Hawashi. Listen to which notes Hawashi chooses to emphasize. There's no rhythmic logic to them, but the force behind every single keystroke is deliberate. Not calculated, it's much more intuitive than that, but with intent. Attack velocity is arguably the most expressive tool a pianist has. It is technically possible to notate everything that he's doing here using dynamic and articulation markings, but it would be difficult for another musician to replicate it deliberately, and that would defeat the purpose of allowing the pianist freedom of expression. When a musician is familiar enough with their instrument, composers don't have to do much to tell them how to play the notes in front of them. Their intuition tells them what to do much faster than instructions or notation could, and in a way that's personal to them. Most of us don't think about how to physically produce speech, right? We just talk. It's the same principle here. Let's move on to the vocals. Unlike piano, the human voice can bend pitches and change its sound pretty dramatically on the fly. Where it's incredibly difficult to notate expression on piano, it's virtually impossible to precisely notate a good vocal performance. For the first section, Emmy Evans keeps things pretty straight and even since she's harmonizing with herself. But in the second half when she's solo and the notes are higher, she has a lot more freedom with how she approaches the melody. This 
this is Grandma. It's the humanity of the performances. Evans uses light vibrato in the second melody, but keeps the pitches pretty straight. It's not an opera or choir performance, it's just raw expression of feeling. This extends into the rhythm as well. In many of Evans' performances, she sings her solos rubato, meaning she robs time from some beats in favor of others. Many of her notes lag behind the beat a little, and sometimes a lot. Her solo ends up having a pensive and soulful quality as a result. This isn't human error, it's musicianship. However, Evans didn't sit down with the music in a notepad and calculate how much vibrato she should use and when. She didn't map out the percentage by which she should delay certain notes, or if she did, that's a cry for help. She's just feeling the music. The piece means something to her, and she invests that meaning back into it. And of course, merit also goes to the director, Keiichi Okabe, either for guiding the performers to this point or for seeing that they were already there and letting them do their thing. Soloists arguably have the most artistic freedom in music performance, but ensembles can also give very emotional performances through dynamics and articulation. Dynamics refer to changes in volume, and articulation is how the notes are played, such as the accents we heard on piano. Although we've been looking at the original arrangement of Grandma, I'm going to switch over to the new one now, and actually just the instrumental. While I do think the new arrangement is too orchestral for the fight with Hook, I can't deny that the new high and low string parts are some of the most gorgeous sounds in the OST. They start off fairly tame, but slowly evolve into something incredible. To get the full impact of the dynamics and the strings, we won't be able to stop part way, so I'm gonna shut up. I'll still put visual aids on screen, but if you're going to focus on just one thing, it should be what the musicians are saying. I don't mean full sentences or specific ideas, the intent of the musicians likely won't quite match your interpretation. But the point isn't to crack a code, the point is to find meaning, and you don't need music theory for that. If you can listen to this part on good speakers or safely turn up the volume, this would be a great time to do that. Enjoy the ride, and I'll see you in the next video. Grandma, can I rest now? I'm so tired.